February 18th premiere week begins and Speed will bring you all its new shows. Supercars Exposed, Drag Race High, Live in the Low Life and more. Hit the primetime slot with new heroes, new muscle and new curves. Speed premiere week begins February 18th. Of course, only on Speed. Now that is the kind of vista we expected at the beginning of this 46th running of the Rolex 24 at Daytona. We're happy to have it today. It is now a beautiful day. The skies have been scoured clean by that breeze. And we are green once again after our record extending 24th yellow flag. The order is Scott Pruitt with three laps on Alex Gurney. Ryan Briscoe is third, another three laps in arrears, then one lap back to Nick Janssen in the first of the Crone Racing Pontiac Riley's Max Angelelli in the number 10 SunTrust car is fifth. And he too is two laps down to the man ahead of him, Nick Janssen. Then Oswaldo Negri, our pole sitter, is in sixth. Six laps behind Angelelli. Oliver Gavin and Jim Matthews round out the top eight. Then the parade of GT cars headed by Rafael Matos in the number 70 Speed Source Mazda. This would be a first victory at Daytona for Speed Source. And for Matos, a real personal triumph. A great story, a young guy who came from Brazil, moved into Florida, worked in a go-kart shop, paid his own way up to the racing ranks, won the Champ Car Atlantic title last year, and with it, a $2 million bonus to go find a ride in the Champ Car World Series. He decided he wasn't gonna do that, and he has been the newest hire at Michael uh, at Andretti Green Racing in the IRL. So he'll run the Indy Pro Series next year and hope to move up and race the Indianapolis 500 someday. Well, he's had a good run here today. I mean, there are five laps up on Andy Lally in the number two uh, spot in GT, the 66 car and 67 car driven by Emmanuel Collard is uh, another lap down on them. And all those TRG Porsches are suffering this overheating problem that they run any RPMs. They're down now from around 9,000 revs to just over 6,000 revs trying to keep those engine temps down. Boy, that, I mean, that is a huge loss of power. It's one of the chrome cars mm -hmm. about to be overtaken. Don't like the look at this lot here with an hour to go. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Wipe out half the field. DP's up high, GT's down low. In turn one, they pile. Not literally, we have. Yes. <laughs> On board with Angelelli in the SunTrust car. Now Max the Axe is not known for his patience in these sorts of potential passing situations, so this could get lively. We have a drive-through penalty for the 77. The Doran that's had a pretty fraught 24 hours thus far, losing wheels into the dirt, yeah. back on track. That's probably for pitting out a procedure because it's not only a drive-through, as you see, they're holding the car for mm -hmm. 20 seconds. So that will have been pitting when you weren't supposed to, which is a stop in your pit, sit there 20 seconds, and then go. And it's already down in 43rd place. Brad Yeager from Cincinnati, Ohio, is on his way. Another fine young American driver on the way up the ladder. Calvin Fish. Well, down here in the Brimos pit with J.C. Franz. J.C., the 59 car, is having such a strong run here this weekend. Talk about the emotions when you're sitting there watching one of your teammates out front and then you have a problem like that. Oh, you can imagine. We were in the back of my motor almost getting ready for my stint. We're jumping up and down, high-fiving, just restarting. Joe was driving away from everybody. And I, but I hear him on the radio saying, hang on, hang on. He said, make it, hang on to what? So we're breaking the around. So it's hard breaking, you know, but that's racing, you know. If it was a 20-hour race, we would have been there. but. So we gained some points, we may get a couple of positions back, and uh, I think we let everybody know we're here for real this year. We're much back, baby. Preparation is the key to one of these races, and uh, certainly the crew do their part. I understand you've had a kind of a weird training routine. You didn't like getting up in the middle of the night for these races. So what have you been up to? Yeah, I've been getting up at 3 in the morning. I go out and run around the neighborhood and sleep for a couple hours, get up at 6 and go to the gym, trying to get used to getting up at odd hours and doing things. And I thought it was working, but last night was kind of pretty tough. It didn't seem to help too much. <laughs> All right, mate, thanks a lot. Let's get down to Chris. Well, it was 2004 when Kevin Doran's chassis won this race, and Kevin Kevin, your car has been here since the inception of the Daytona prototype. However, last year, Delara bought your constructor's license, and at the next race, we're going to see that car. How exciting for you is that? Uh, it's definitely exciting. Uh, our car just didn't quite keep the pace of the Crawford and the, uh, particularly the Riley. So uh, with the new car, hopefully we'll be back on pace. You know, the, the door name kind of slips back to a team status, uh, parts distributor with Delara. 
but uh, with the Delara factory building the cars, I expect it to be very, very good. Now, Sun Trust is going to have a brand new car. You're going to reskin the 77, also potentially another car. Yes, there's um, there's definitely interest. I think the Delara name brings people to the sport, and um, the Frizzell family is looking at maybe doing a selected schedule uh, later this year. Well, this has been a tough race for them. They just received a stop-and-go penalty. They're having some tran transmission problems with that car, some overheating, and so they pitted out a sequence because of that, they thought, because of the problems, they would be fine, but uh, Grand Am did bring them in. Well, still in all, Brad Yeager is picking up some valuable experience behind the wheel of that car. Kevin Doran told me a year ago he was looking desperately to find a partner to help him compete with the likes of the Lolas and Rileys of the world, and he has found one. Oh, three wide on the super stretch. Here comes the chicane. And that's, that's the leader, GT. That's right. And it's very, very slippery down here. A lot of mud and grass has been dragged on the road all through the night and the rain there. You can see it all on the apex and, of course, off to the left there lurking, waiting to catch you out if you have to go wide. Now, boss, one of the Ferraris. If I was a leader in GT yeah, with a five-lap lead, I don't know that I would have really gone there. No, I'm not sure I would have done either. Kevin Doran, of course, a great story. He was the uh, crew chief when oh, Derek yeah. Bell and Al Holbert were the height of their winning streak back there in the uh, 80s. Yeah, he's won this race several times, the yeah. crew chief for Holbert Racing. He's, I guess Kevin's a lot older than he looked, or he has to be <laughs> the youngest race-winning crew chief of all time. Absolutely. He must have been very young when he was doing the winning, yeah. He comes from a racing family and loves the dirt tracks. Grand Craftsman Truck Series for a while, has his own team there. And yep. He's kind of done it all. He knows his way around a race he car, no doubt about does, it. Yeah, and that car, that Doran, when it first came out, was a really uh, neat looking car. Yeah, that car always has been pretty. You know what, it always, it always does really well at certain racetracks. He's always really been good at Watkins Glen, for instance. We are at one hour even, and the clock continues to tick its way down. And at the end, a group of drivers will write their names in the Rolex 24 Daytona history book and pick up a beautiful stainless steel Rolex Daytona wristwatch. And that's the last Mustang running these guys, obviously. Um, that's the Black Forest car. I think that, I thought that retired. It was originally it reported as retired, yeah. But here they are. Yeah, look at the sides of it. It's been sitting somewhere out of harm's way. But it's not all beat to death. Yeah. Yeah, Carl, uh, Carl Jensen, who's one of the drivers, told me the other afternoon that they have the oldest average age in the field, round about 65 plus or minus. It depends if Boris jumps into the team, but <laughs> he brings the average down a bit. Living the dream. Carl Jensen, of course, big into historic racing. Mm -hmm. He signed up a hot shoe and Boris said to help shepherd them through the process. Don't think Boris ever got in the car, though. Uh huh. Cup was set up, things like that. They were having fun, and that was their intent. They said, look, we're not going to win this thing. We don't have any aspirations of winning this. We'd like to finish it, and we'd like to go out there and have a good time, because that's what these guys are about. Well, that's another element of this race that we didn't talk about with the big international flavor and all the great drivers and champions from other series. This is probably the only major race in the world where a qualified, let's call them amateurs, can come out and race with some of the biggest stars in the sport. That, too, is one of the stories of the Rolex 24 at Daytona, and we'll be back in a moment live here on Speed. Welcome back to Daytona. Once again, we want to thank DirecTV for our aerial coverage, these beautiful shots of what has become a beautiful day here in Daytona Beach, Florida. Remember, NASCAR Hot Pass is available only on DirecTV, and it puts you behind the wheel. We're just getting started here at Daytona on speed. These cars will roll out. The stock cars will roll in. The action begins next week. Of course, it all culminates with the 50th anniversary Daytona 500 on Fox. On board with the race leading Lexus Riley in the hands of Scott Pruitt, looking for his second straight victory and third straight for Ganassi Racing with Felix Sabatis. Yeah, boy, I tell you what, a lot going through his mind at the moment. Seen a lot of breakers around them. They know their car overheats. Uh, so, and the, and, the, and the day's getting hotter and hotter and hotter, so they just absolutely must have their heart in their mouth. Now you're on board with Max Angelelli in the SunTrust car. 
I said earlier Max can be pretty aggressive in traffic situations but there's an upside and a downside to those sorts of activities one lap ago in this very corner let's see what Max got himself into here he comes up the inside of that GT Whoa. car forces and a GT car through the middle of the grass here no, that's both a GT car like that. That's the number 81 car. He's had an adventurous weekend. Oh, my. At that corner on Thursday while you and I were there. About that, yeah, four laps into the weekend. That's such a narrow exit, that corner, because that wall is actually taller than what you can see around it. Yeah, really. So you don't know what's up on the other side of that. And it's flat out through there. It's Mark Patterson getting in, team principal for the 60 car, going to do some time in the car himself. A little more grist for his, <laughs> his emails. Yeah, he's probably going to be doing his blog on the Blackberry right. while he drives along. The blog we heard about earlier. I happen to be on his email list, and we get him on a daily basis from wherever the Grand Dam Rolex Series travels. He's a character. Oh, he's a very funny guy. Originally from South Africa, you can see the South African flag on the shroud around the onboard camera on the roof of the car. It's like a few of the bits they started that race with in that car are still on it. Pulse, not like many. Pulse. From the pole, that's right. Yeah, the hands of Oswald and Gregory. Quite a bit, and he got punted off by uh, Patrick Long uh, when Oswald, uh, the pole sitter, was driving it. And, and uh, early this morning, about six o'clock, and he got high sided down at turn three, lost, lost three laps right there. The big damage was in Justin Wilson, however, when he went through the pothole and right. tore up the rear suspension. Right. Race leader is headed for the Ganassi pits, Calvin. Well, just over 52 minutes left in this race, so this should be their last scheduled pit stop here today. Scotty Pruitt going for his eighth victory here at the Rolex 24. What a history he has with this event, and it'll be his third overall win. And this is a big one for these boys. They're not taking tires, but they're very comfortable with these Pirelli tires. As you mentioned, David, in their performance and durability, they want everyone out of the way. They don't want any problems on this final pit stop, so it's fuel only blowing out these radiator grills. Bit of a strategy call here on the tires. I mean, there's plenty of heat out on the racetrack right now, so getting cold tires up to speed shouldn't have been a problem. They just want to play it safe. They don't want any snafu with a wheel nut that sticks or anything and cost them a couple of laps, so routine stuff. Threw it back underway. You can see there, Scott did not do the big old burnout deal. Now that time, they didn't put tires on. Had he tried to do the burnout with those hot tires, it would have really shock loaded the rear transmission, the rear half shafts, so forth. So you heard it, you just slipped the clutch, let the thing get rolling. So he just fried the clutch instead. Yeah, no, I didn't really. It was something pretty tough. He's got traffic ahead of him on that very narrow, very slippery pit out. Back to Calvin. Here with Timmy Keane, who's uh, overseeing the 01 machine. Tim, should be your final stop, mate. You didn't take tires. What's the strategy there? Well, we just don't want a mistake on the last stop. If a wheel nut gets jammed up or anything like that, the tires have been lasting a long time. It's easy to double stent them, and we're not pushing the car that hard, so it's the smartest choice to make. How's the water temperature issue? It's, if we run really hard, it gets it's pushing it, but, you know, we're, we're looking to run around 147, 148, and we're good to the end. All right, mate, best of luck. Thanks. Thank you, Calvin. Over the years, the shape of the racetrack has changed. The cars have certainly changed, as have the drivers. Even the name of the race has changed over the years, but some things do not change about endurance racing. As we heard, two-time world champion and three-time Rolex winner Derek Bell say at the top of the show, he loves it for all the things endurance racing requires. Consistency, courage, skill, teamwork, preparation, and a whole lot of luck. Yep, you need them all. All everything's going to be just dead right. That was a very smart call by Lee Keen. He nailed it. You know, why would you go ahead and change tires? I mean, wheel nuts become a problem. If you get one half off and it sticks and jams on there, then you're going to be sitting down there trying to cut it off and do something. Right now, just get the fuel that it needs in there and go cruise. Well, you could just see the fatigue in Tim Keen's face, though. Yeah. It has been a long night for those guys. That was the 57 car of Andrew Davis. That Gaines go card just went past. 57 currently shown 19th overall. These little fuzzy things here and here are the tops of the master cylinders, and they put those little things on to absorb any leakage that would come out. You've got one for the, each of the brakes, front and back, and you've got one for the clutch. They look like tennis wristbands. Yes, they do. <laughs> back down to Calvin. Well, another driver had a stellar run going here tonight, Bob, was David Donahue. David, the car was so strong, and then just those little problems that you get in a 24-hour, they've bitten you. 
Yeah, so one, one self-inflicted, but one can wait a fuel line come apart inside the uh, fuel cell. So it's a shame. It's, uh, we have a really good balanced car. It's, uh, it's fast. It's, it's fast and nice to drive whenever it's out there running. Unfortunately, it hasn't always been out there running like clockwork as much as we'd like. I'd like to say hi at home to uh, Bob Carlson this time. So much preparation goes into one of these races, David, and last year you kind of run them with an injured shoulder. You went through some rehab, and uh, you had one of the most famous doctors in the country putting you back together, and you kind of messed it all up a little bit. Tell us that story. Oh, uh, well, I didn't exactly follow a doctor's advice, I guess. I was feeling uh, a little bit better than I really was, which I guess is classic for a race car driver. And uh, just trying to get dressed, I uh, lifted more than a pencil, and I was only supposed to lift as much as a pencil, so... You know, listen to your doctor. He has some great stats going, and you've just dropped his percentage all the way around, right? I'm just rubbing it in. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he did that enough. I, I don't need it from you, too. <laughs> all right, mate, that's right. Especially on a hot Sunday morning. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, David, right. Race car drivers think we're impervious to the rules, if you will, of the human body. <laughs> well, his dad, yeah, when we drove in 1971 at uh, Sebring, after the 24 hour here, we went to Sebring and his father twisted his leg badly. And he was hobbling around, and of course, his dad did everything in the shop. I mean, he swept the floor, he did all the design work. It was a real workaholic. And he drove the truck down here with his dodgy foot. <laughs> the late Mark Donahue wrote a great book called The Unfair Advantage. It's worth a read. And of course, much of Mark Donahue's fame was shared with Roger Penske. There's another son of a famous racing father, Alex Gurney. His father, Dan, has won the Rolex 24 as both a driver and a car owner. In fact, his Gurney Toyota Eagles still hold the all-time lap record here at Daytona. And always will, I believe. Yeah, <laughs> big turbos on those cars. Little engines. There's Roger. <laughs> Captain. Captain. Like he's dressed for an outdoor hockey game. He does. It was a bit chilly this morning. There's no question about that. When I came across on the golf cart for my coach, my eyes were watering quite a bit when I came up here to relieve you guys. I got up. We uh, we were at a meeting the other night. The Road Racing Drivers Club had a dinner at the uh, Daytona 200 Club, and um, Roger was sent an emissary along to pick up an award because Roger was out of town buying a boat company. So oh, another trophy under his back. I'd have to go talk to Roger. Getting back to the tribulations of David Donahue and that Brumos car, what are the chances that a fuel line is going to come apart inside the cell? Yeah, that is well, I'll tell you what it's about, like, right? because in 1968, on that very pit lane in a GT40 leading comfortably, the team manager signaled me to get out. So I said, well, it's not by the end of my stint. Yeah, got to get out. I'll get out. And there's the fuel just running straight out from underneath the car. The mag tank had somehow a water hole in the because it turned out the monocot wasn't properly lined with tape and the, and the rivets had worn a hole in the back so it can watch this Rafael Matos here he is the GT leader has been the leader for quite some time with a five lap lead speed source Mazda guys and look at that car if you will I don't see any place anywhere around that car where it has any damage whatsoever mm -hmm. So often, the cars that go to victory lanes are the ones with the fewest battle scars. Brian Till. One of the other Mazda RX-8s on pit road, the Racer's Edge Motorsports entry, the number 30. Drew Stavely getting behind the wheel. He'll take it to the checkered flag. This Mazda showing the scars of battle out there. Stavely was one of the finalists on Speed's setup show. So make sure you stay tuned for this year's version of setup. You never know where tomorrow's talent's going to come from. Drew Stavely, definitely one of those young, talented race car drivers who's getting a shot. Stavely strapping in. He'll be back on track to take this Mazda to the checkered flag, Calvin. Well, the 40 car's certainly been through the wars a little bit over the last 23 hours. They're trying to get through this last one, and they're putting the man, Patrick Dempsey, behind the wheel. He already spoke to us just a short while ago about what a great experience this has been, but there's nothing like seeing that checkered flag at the end of 24 hours. We'll see if he's got his lessons learned about the cold tires when he gets down here to pit out. I'm sure he will not make that same mistake. Comes the 30 car out ahead of him. Well, a lot more temperature in the track now in the middle of the night uh, there's no doubt about it it was a bit of an issue these 
The new Pirelli tyres uh, haven't got a lot of grip in the first, just the first couple of corners, and it's something the drivers are going to have to adjust to. Both those cars we're looking at in GT had multiple crashes last night. Uh, Ken Dobson was driving the Pontiac and must have had a target painted on him because everybody just drop kicked him around. <laughs> Of course, Patrick Dempsey had his two problems in this car, once leaving pit lane and once getting up in the International Horseshoe. Uh, the team's, of course, done a good job, and they, both cars still running. It's great to have guys like Patrick Dempsey here. Number one, he is a true car guy with a small collection of his own. Number two, he's a very useful racer, learning his lessons as every racer has to as he goes along. He's also dedicated to the sport, and he'll bring fans to it. And he's to be good for the He's game. not taking this as a gentleman driver type of situation. Oh, no. He's taking this. He wants to be able to be, as Paul Newman was, he wants to be able to win a race on his own, to be skillful enough, fast enough on his own, to go out here and compete against the best in the world. So that's a serious commitment. Well, he's got his work cut out to be as good as Paul Newman. I mean, I raced against Paul Newman in Trans Am in 1983, and he was unbelievably quick, and he was already about 60 then. Yeah. I had him as a driver. I had him in driving school and exactly. raced against him through the amateur years and professionally, and you're absolutely right. I think if he started off being a race driver instead of a film star, he would have been very, very successful. Well, Patrick Dempsey is the latest in a long line of Hollywood stars who were good racing drivers, not only Paul Newman or Steve McQueen, uh, Gene Hackman, James Garner, all those guys were very serious James about Garner their team when I drove in the Formula 5000 championship and super guy. But you know, acting, the, the concentration level to do that job and the concentration level to do this job are the same. I mean, you have to be able to alienate all the things around you and concentrate on just that task at hand to make it done, do it perfectly. Well, that's another of the great aspects of this race in particular, the sport in general, is you always have young people coming on. A moment ago, we saw the 30 car from Racer's Edge. It's run by a guy named John Meraki. He's been in the sport for a long time, runs a terrific program. My son, Matt, drove in Star Mazda for John. Rob Dyson, a well-known name here at Daytona. His son, Clint, drove for John Meraki at one time. Well, the, the doctor's got around a lap there, so without incident. So race car drivers can be actors, and I'm all these years been acting to being a human being, and I'm really not. I was Chris just, I was just asked me. if we knew any famous producers. Of course, Lucas from Star Wars is absolutely a nut, a Formula One nut. Sorry, Chris. It's Chris Tyson, not Clint. Thinking of the Mirrors boys. Speaking of Chris's, Chris Neville awaits the GT leader. Well, Rafael Matos bringing the 70 speed source machine to pit lane. The final time in this race, Sylvan Tremblay, the team honor, he's going to take the honors of taking this thing across the stripe. The team saying that this car is just running flawlessly. There was some contact at the rear of the car late last night, and uh, one of those tail lights is missing. The other is being held in place by a bunch of bear bonds because they don't want to lose that tail light. If they did, they would be brought to pit lane. So. The team, uh, it looks like that one's pretty secure. I don't think it's going anywhere. Mazda looking to win their 22nd class win here at the Rolex 24. So they've uh, they've seen victory lane quite a few times here. And uh, the team really taking their time. Tires done, fuel done. Silva Tremblay just getting belted up there. You know, Dorsey, one of the amazing things about the motor in this car is it can go 50 hours of racing until they need to rebuild it. It's only about a $35,000 motor, and on rebuilds, it's only $8,000 to rebuild it, and they really only change out about four moving parts. And for the people at home that think that's a lot of money, that is dirt cheap. That is just no money at all. Oh, this little thing just runs and runs like a clock. Yeah, there was a time that Mazda was absolutely the car to have in the lightweight GT categories. They won 12 in a row here at the Rolex back in the 1980s. We'll take a break and return with more as the time continues to tick away in the final hour of the 46th Rolex 24 at Daytona. Now there's something you don't see every day. <laughs> Actually, every one of us on the speed crew is going to take that flight to our respective destinations one at a time. And then we start taking the bags. And then we start taking the television equipment. <laughs> That's and normally how they send me to Le Mans over here. <laughs> me and the... <laughs> Let's say what you wish for. Let's say first, but they say, when you say, can I sit in the front cabin? <laughs> me, and problem. Me, and Lindbergh. That front <laughs> me and Lindbergh, we got the same flight. <laughs> you got, you got 
There is the race leader, Scott Pruitt, still with that three-lap advantage over the reigning champion, Alex Gurney, in the Grand Am Rolex Series. And while we're on the subject of Le Mans, we'll let Calvin pick up the story. Yeah, one of the class winners at Le Mans, Darren Turner, running with the Crown Racing Boys this weekend. How's the experience been with the team? Uh, for my first uh, Daytona, I've loved it. I'm just saying to Brian there, the, the chief mechanic here, it's just been a great race. We've been up and down like a yo-yo with performance. We've had lots of little problems, but we're still running in, in fourth place, so uh, hopefully we can stay there to the flag now. We've done Le Mans a bunch of times, obviously all the other endurance races, Sebring and uh, Petit Le Mans, but Daytona is a little bit different, a lot of nighttime running. How is it different from Le Mans? What's the biggest difference from your perspective? I think mainly the traffic and the fact that you, you never really get a rest, you know, even with the banking you're always having to concentrate and uh, for me it's like one of the first times dealing with a spotter as well let, talking you around the circuit so uh, it's completely different from any 24-hour race I've done before and uh, it's like a war out there you look at the cars now and the, some of them look like they've come out of the Mad Max movie or something like that they're in the right state so uh, it's just been great I mean I, I want to come back next week and do it all again one of the guys you typically battle over in the American Le Mans series Ollie Gap with the Corvette team you typically run in the Ferraris and Astons of course any little rivalry going on this week going on about who's going to be here in the different Chrome cars? Who, me and Ollie? Yeah. Uh, no rivalry, we're having a great time. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, we're going to look at who's got the fastest lap, but I think, you know, Ollie's done it before, so he might have nipped it this time. So uh, I'll hopefully come back next year and uh, be able to have another run at him then. But uh, it's good because normally, like Appetit and then Le Mans itself, we're always against each other, and it's uh, you know, a good rivalry there. But here we're working together and working as a team, both cars. Um, all the data is available between us, it's, it's really good. And also, it's the first time I've had a, a good chance to get him, to get to know Ollie away from, you know, the competition. All right, mate, great to see you here at Daytona. Cheers, thanks a lot. Well, he brings up a great point about the traffic. You know, when you go to Le Mans, eight-mile circuit, you don't pass cars every, you know, 300 yards or so. Here at Daytona, with the way the course is configured, you know, you're, you're always in traffic. You're never going to get a full, clean lap in. Well, you never get out. I mean, there's a lot more cars here to start on. the 66 cars on a three-and-a-half-mile circuit as opposed to 44 cars on an eight-and-a-half-mile circuit. And uh, it's really crammed into this sort of fishbowl with the, with the oval and the, and the small infield track. And, of course, what we've seen even this morning, every time there's a restart, somebody runs into somebody else as they weave their way through the infield. So it, for him, it would be very different from the month. And like we said last night, there is a lot more dark here right than the month. The month's run on the longest weekend of the year in June. In France, it's light till 11, gets light in the morning at 4. And here it gets dark in the afternoon at 5 and doesn't get light till 7. Of course, we didn't see sunlight till about two hours ago. Well, no, so. right. <laughs> Ryan Briscoe making his way around. Ooh, I see a little smoke yeah, coming out, yeah. of the, out of the back there. A lot of overheating. That's not good. That was the first telltale signs I've seen of that, and that was not debris on the racetrack. That looked like wisps of overheating fluids. We'll take a look at it here as he gets a tail away shot. Yep. Suddenly appears to have disappeared. Usually means it's out of whatever it was leaking. <laughs> Watch the gauges. Turn six and up onto the banking. Yeah, I don't see any there. I didn't see it that time either. A solid third place as the captain, Roger Penske, returns to Daytona. I was speaking with Penske Racing President Tim Sindrich at the test, and he said that their organization would be open to a full season effort if the planets aligned and sponsorship were available. Yet another area in which one of America's all-time greatest racing entrepreneurs can come to play. I wonder how much this uh, this event now, after 35 years of absence, has spurred Penske's competitive juices to come and want to do this back again. Less than 32 minutes to go to potential history for Ganassi Racing with Felix Sabatis, 2006. One of Chip's trademark interdisciplinary lineups, Scott Dixon brought the car home. Last year, Juan Pablo Montoya, Scott Pruitt, and the gang made it two in a row for Ganassi Racing. And now this year, Pruitt, Montoya, and two others will bring those two gentlemen, Chip Ganassi 
On the right, on the left, Felix Sabatis. On the far left, Mike Hull, who Chip Ganassi told us this morning is the man who really runs this Grand Am operation. Part of the Ganassi racing empire that includes Indy cars and NASCAR, of course. Guys like Ganassi and Sabatis are just setting up camp here in Daytona. They're going to be here for a while with this race and then the stock car action rolling in. Felix's boat will be here, no doubt, fairly soon. Mm -hmm. Take you up, take you up most of the harbor that Roger Penske's boat does not take up. Credit Mike Hall for the effort he's put in with this team too. It is meticulously organized. We saw them basically rebuild an entire car in 16 minutes yesterday when Salvador Duran went off and tore off the front of the car. They really know what they're about. We'll be back in a moment. Don't miss Direct TV Speed Weeks as we launch Speed High Def with 100 hours of coverage from here in Daytona, everywhere on and off the track, documenting the struggle to make the field for the 50th anniversary Daytona 500. Speed Weeks coverage begins February 7th, 5 p.m. Eastern. NASCAR on speed. Be there. Let's, let's go down to the pit lane. Calvin Fish is standing by with our pole sitter for this race. He was indeed, Bob, just 24 hours ago, or just less than that, actually. Uh, Ozzy, you led the field to green, and you had an awfully strong race car, and it kind of just got away from you a little bit over the last few hours. Yeah, you know, it was, uh, it was a comparing. It was a lot easier to get the pole. You know, it's a long race, lots of things happen, and, uh, you know, we were unlucky uh, in a few uh, times. Uh, I think uh, we had a failure with uh, with Justin, I'm not sure. But, uh, you know, considering sixth, I think it's good if we can, uh, you know, carry it to the end. Talk about Mike Shank and this group of people that he's put together. I mean, Mike isn't one of the big name car owners like Chip Ganassi or Roger Penske, but, boy, he's really come a long ways over the last half dozen years. Mike is a bulldog. He's a racer, you know. That's what I love about him. Uh, he will do whatever it takes. And uh, just like I said before, he wants to win as bad as I want to win, so it's a good combination. All right, mate. Great performance this weekend. Thank you very much, guys. In fact, it was a record-setting performance from Oswaldo Negri in the Daytona Pride prototype era. A lap at 140.793, averaging 127.152 miles an hour. Stout stuff and a bit of a redemptive pole for Oz as well. He might have been on pole for this race a year ago, but got a little over exuberant down in turn one on what might have been his best lap. Got offline, wobbled off the track, and lost that opportunity. I know we're talking about records and the fact that Chip Ganassi could be the first team owner in Grand Am history to win three Rolexes in a row, but back in the 24 hour days, a man named Jack Roush won nine times consecutively. He's actually won this race ten times, but nine in a row. And he was here just the other day as an interesting spectator and said, you know, with Ford's commitment on this engine program, he goes, I think I'd like to get back in here too. How monumental would it be for another high-end team owner like Jack Roush this year? That's right. Jack won in class in the GTO division, not the overall, but he absolutely dominated that class. And his engines are out here. Roush Yates engines are out here. In fact, Jack's son, Jack Jr., drove in the Cody right. Challenge race on Friday, and you will see that race on speed. 680 laps in the books of this 3.56-mile racetrack. That's 2,420.8 miles, approximately. There's another big-name car owner and former winner of this race on the premises, and Calvin is with him. Well, Bobby Ray Hill's down here at the back of the Mike Shank garage and having a chat with some journalists down here. We'll try and... Get a quick word with him. Bobby, great to see you here at Daytona. Former Grand Marshal here, former race winner back in 81, but watching your son, Graham. What a career this boy has had. I mean, you must be very proud of his progress, and more than that, just what he is as a nice young man. Well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of amazing. You're 19, this is your third 24-hour. I mean, that just doesn't kind of, you know, that's hard, that's hard to uh, put in uh, real terms, because I didn't do my third 24-hour until I was about 35. Uh, but, um, no, I think it's great for him. And anytime you can drive a race car, no matter what it is, I think you can learn and it can make you a better driver. And for him, 
I've said it before. He's at he's at an age where he's like a big sponge. Every time he gets in something, he's learning a lot. And I think I think it's I, I like the fact that he likes endurance racing because uh, I think it's a it's a very legitimate uh, aspect of a career that he can have, and uh, both while he's doing open wheel and even after. So these are great races, and it's great he's a part of it. You seem to have taken him in a direction, as you just mentioned, Bob. He's really jumping in all types of race cars, just really soaking it up. And ultimately, you think I'll make him a better race car driver? Well, I think uh, I think endurance racing, especially because you have to learn how to go quickly and yet save the car. You know, don't expend a lot of energy. You really have to. It really teaches you, I think, uh, some disciplines that you don't get if you just do sprint races all the time. So, um, you know, I think it's, it gets you know. For a young guy, it really puts him <clears throat> under pressure to, to, to really start to develop good judgment, you know, and, and, and that's so important, you know, when to pass, when not to pass. All those things uh, can do nothing but uh, do good things for him later on. All right, mate, thanks a lot. Thank you. Bobby Rahal certainly knows whereof he speaks. Not only is he Graham's dad, a former winner, he's also here as the president of the Road Racing Drivers Club for all their activities this weekend. Coming up on 22 minutes and a three lap lead for Scott Pruitt. They've had the lead now for 87 laps, spanking the field. But does that mean they are the hands down winners with this much time remaining? Far from it. Let's take you back to 2004 and Tony Stewart. Here is a NASCAR champion, was driving a Pontiac Crawford with a star-studded driver lineup, and a two-by-four had to be used to try to buttress a broken suspension. Stewart out there basically looping on three wheels until that suspension finally broke, and 20 minutes from the flag, Max Crawford and his team were out of the Rolex 24. Absolutely, bitterly, bitterly disappointed. I've seen it with, uh, with um, Dyson car leading you know 20 minutes to go and all goes up in smoke you know how many times did we do that three times or something the last 20 minutes were through bike yet. oh boy that's when the ghosts start speaking to you in chorus from around the race car and around the paddock area the mantra of 24 hour races for me is if it's gonna break for goodness sake get it over <laughs> that's right you get, get it really played the hotel for dinner <laughs> absolutely right just drag it on till the end and then quitting just just breaks your heart well a lot of guys down there in their pit lane who are starting to cross their fingers we enter the final 20 minutes of the 46th Rolex 24 at Daytona, and we'll be back. Welcome back live to Daytona International Speedway. Not many folks in the grandstands, but it's always that way. You want to be down on the infield, and some 55,000 sports car fans have spent the last 24 hours or more down there. Come cold and rain, and now bright sunshine and Atlantic breezes. There's the number 66 racers group Porsche in the hands of Andy Lally, a former GT class champion. Behind him, the 67 of Emmanuel Collard. And somewhere out there, the 64 and the 69 TRG cars. So you have four racers group cars there. How are they racing? Well, not exactly, Dorsey. Now they're all overheating and they've been told to get in order for a photo op at the end in about 15 minutes. And you'll see when they go up on the banking, they'll separate so they all get clean air to the radiator. Those cars are hanging on, but they're in their pecking order that they'll finish. Let's hear from one of the drivers on the 66. He's standing by with Brian. Landy Lally behind the wheel right now, sharing that car with Ted Blue, Richard Westbrook, and this man, Bryce Miller. Bryce, last year you helped Dirk Werner to his championship because you were there with him every step of the way, except here. And if you had been in the car with him, you would have shared that championship too. This year, you have the same co-driver all year long, and you got a good finish going here. You think a championship? Yeah, it's uh, it, it's certainly a good feeling to be able to share share in the opening points. You know, the start of the season and. And uh, it, it's a, it establishes a little bit of closure. You know, last year I didn't, I didn't have that. And uh, I'm really looking forward to this year. Ted Blue is a great co-driver. TRG is a great team. And um, I'm looking forward to a great year. 
We had some great runs last year. I know you had a victory at VIR with Dirk Werner. What did you learn last year that you can bring to TRG that's going to help you to get to that top step of the podium at the end of the year? Oh, what did I learn? I, I guess uh, how to go after a championship, you know, how to how to uh, pace yourself, how to how to push, you know, when it's when, it, when it's important and preserve when when it's important. So um, I think that's the biggest thing. You know, I've been able to apply some of that here and I've had great co-drivers and uh, just keep soaking it up. So. Bryce Miller, one of the great young talents that was discovered here last year. No reason to think that he won't fight for the championship all year long. He's got a great team, guys. No question about that. Seven cars from the racers group here. Seven also from Farnbacher Lowell's, the highest placed of those, currently in 15th place. Damian Faulkner at the controls. All of which will be beaten by this car if it yep. makes another 15 minutes. Selvin Tremblay, the speed source Mazda, has been the thorn in TRG's side this year, unfortunately. Sat on the pole. And what must be even more irritating to them, they're all suffering from overheating, and they've got half their radiator blanked off. So, <laughs> so they're ready for the hot weather. This car is run just like the train, no problems with it. They had a skirmish in the middle of the night with a little uh, rear contact, but other than that, clear sailing. As we said earlier, Mazda was once the car to have in the lightweight GT class. Winners of nearly two dozen races here at Daytona International Speedway. In the hands of guys like Jack Baldwin and Tommy Kendall and Roger Mandeville and Amos Johnson and Jim Downing. All those great years with those unique rotary engines. Now it appears a new era of Mazda GT success may be opening. There's the number nine in the pits, Calvin. What's up? Well, no service on the car other than blowing out the radiators. And it looks like they repurged the water system. They have a quick connect on the left side there, and I think that's what it's doing. Dorsey may know more, but uh, just trying to nurse this one to the finish, boys. Well, they're just giving it its last drink of water, and they're going to send it on its way. Oops, this may be more complicated. The number 14 that was involved in a big accident at the first turn of the first lap when Scooter Gable and Anthony Lazaro got together. Maybe going behind the wall. They fought to get that car back out here. Now it looks like it may not see the checkered flag. Less than 13 minutes to go. We've got one more break to get in that will take you to the checkered flag and beyond here on speed. Scott Pruitt looking for his third overall win. And second in a row. We'll be back. Welcome back look down on the turn six area at Daytona International Speedway. There's the West Horseshoe we've been yakking on for nearly 24 hours about. They say if you want to win the 24 hours of Le Mans, you talk to Reinhold Yost. If you want to win the Indy 500, go find Roger Penske. Well, it appears if you want to win the Rolex 24, go find Chip Ganassi's number because it appears for the third straight year, Ganassi racing with Felix Sabatis will triumph overall here at the Rolex. And what a moment for Dario Franchitti on this driver's train. Oh. Comes here, first race wins, and that continues a funny trend. Back in 1997, Ari Leyendijk won the Indy 500. The next January, he won the Rolex 24. In 2005, Dan Weldon won the Indy 500. The spring of 2006, he won the Rolex 24. And now Dario Franchitti, winner of last year's Indy 500, it appears with 8 minutes, 41 seconds to go will pick up a victory in the Rolex 24. That's pretty impressive. Well, I wonder if Dario will win the 500 in three weeks time. <laughs> I was just about to say, yeah, you think it's going to be this easy for him in two weeks? I don't think so. <laughs> oh, different environment, different element. Very, very different. Should the win come, it'll be the third straight, not only for Ganassi, but for their Lexus power plant and for the Riley chassis. He's got Truett's third overall win, mm -hmm. not in a row, but good for him. Well, there, but for the grace of God, there's a lot of people could have won this race. I mean, this has been a, was an incredibly closely fought yep. event to start with. People have dropped out with various odd little bits and pieces. 
it didn't Just really a huge amount of lead change. It, it didn't really develop a pattern until no? really this morning, no. early this morning. Right. When we left the air, or when we left you and Lee Diffie on the air at eight o'clock this morning, we had five cars on right. the lead lap. It was incredibly competitive. There's Dario. Dario right there. Yeah, that one little gearbox in the uh, 99 car. The uh, 59 with the broken suspension. 59 with the broken suspension. The 6 car with the broken suspension. 60 knocking the rear end off of it. Odd little mistakes, just, and then odd things breaking. It's going to be a big day for the entire Franchitti family. We heard from his brother Marino last night, as you see Juan Pablo Montoya on the podium. Uh, his father, George, I believe, was coming, and... Dario said his wife Ashley Judd was to be here, but I heard she wasn't feeling well. If that's true, I hope she feels better now. Of course, winning the Rolex 24 probably goes a long way to achieving that. Would for me, the Rolex part would. <laughs> <laughs> probably tune me right up. Well, he should be on time from now. Well, the great, I don't know. <laughs> the great distance runner Emil Zatopek once said, if you just want to win a race, go run 100 meters. Don't waste your time. But if you want an experience, you run the marathon. And I think that's the case with 24-hour endurance racing. It is an experience. We had 66 cars, nearly 300 drivers from around the world, each living his own personal dream. Some of those dreams were shattered during the course of the night and the ensuing day. But some of those dreams will be realized. And I wonder if any of the guys here at Target Ganassi Racing Imagine that they would be able to pull this off for the third straight year. We've talked about the strain and the stresses on the car. What about these drivers? I can tell you having run 12 or 13 of these 24 hours here, no matter whether you win or lose or if you crash or not, for the next week, these guys are going to be feeling it. Some of them got to go back to work. And terrific, terrific bashing you take around here because there's a lot of side load on here, a lot of downforce is going through the car, and then those tight infield corners really work you over. Now but there are steady, as many. Steady, steady, lad, steady, don't yeah. Whoa, steady. <laughs> Pardon me, excuse me. Coming through. Not not but there are as many guys from that group of nearly 300 drivers who will go home with a smile on their face, no matter what happened during the race, because they came here and they can say they did it. Absolutely. Guys like Patrick Dempsey, you know, mm -hmm. for instance, this is. This will be his fondest memory of this year, more than likely, you know, having competed and finished. Some of those young drivers we've been talking about, like Brad Yeager, mm -hmm. Graham Rahal, Colin Brown, Andrew Ranger, and some of the old salts like Carl Jensen, and Derek Bell, who sadly didn't get into the car that he said would be his last international race. Since he didn't actually get to race it before the car crashed out, I wonder. Well, maybe we asked him that. We asked him that oh, last night. Yeah, we said, well, since you didn't even get to get in, is this maybe not the last? He said, well, maybe not. He said, I'm a bit disappointed. <laughs> I said, I didn't want to go out like this. There's Jimmy Vassar and John Fogarty. They're currently in second place. They won the championship last season uh, without finishing this race, so they're getting this championship season up to a much better start than this time last Well, year. exactly. It's been pointed out. I mean, they finished this race, what, 22nd last year? They'll have a whole lot more points in hand. But that hand will not be connected to a wrist upon which lies one of those beautiful Rolex Daytona watches. Now, if little Scott is well, slow up, well, 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 uh, just a little bit, he'll only have one more time to go when he gets to start finish line. If he'll slow up just a bit. Four minutes to go, and that's a pace car lap around here. The speed of a pace car lap, four minutes. So I think Scott's going to make it twice around. Maybe he's having fun. He doesn't want to stop yet. I was talking with some folks about those Rolexes. They said, well, you know, the, the Rolex Daytona watch costs this much when it's new. But when it's engraved, with the special engraving that goes on the back saying it has gone to a winner of the Rolex 24 at Daytona International Speedway, suddenly it's three times the original value, at least, I would think. But of course, you can't put a monetary value on what it means to these drivers to come here and win. Ask Alan McNish, who still has those two second place finishes. Yeah. I had a lot of second place finishes, I remember that, before I finally got to win it. You know, you took it for granted, you thought, well, you get to win one of these, but it's not as easy for a guy that makes it multiple times. It's phenomenal with the amount of competition that you have to face with. Incredible. 
So you meet guys like Tom Christensen, who, as Calvin said earlier, won Le Mans seven times, or Derek Bell, who's won this race three times, or Hurley Haywood, who's won it five times, or Andy Wallace, who came here and won, I think, the first time he ever set foot in the place. He won at Le Mans the first time he set foot there as well. Mm -hmm. Of course, Christensen didn't take a jet over here. He walked across. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, of course, Christensen not only won seven Le Mans, he won what, six of them in succession. Yeah. Those are great Audi teams. There's one of the banner most sports car there. Alex Gurney. Alligator, as it says on the top there. That's, That's right. Those <laughs> unique motorcycles built by Father Dan's company. All American racers still out there. Getting very big in the aviation business, I understand. A lot of fabrication work. Second place will be a cold comfort when you're a Gurney, I would imagine. It's a lot of work for second place. <laughs> yeah. That is the trouble. Second, everybody congratulates you on being second, but it is the first of the losers. That's the trouble with second. Now, depending on how fast Scott Pruitt chooses to pedal, we could be beginning the last lap. In fact, it's official. The white flag is in the air. One lap to go here at Daytona. And with that, obviously, he could not be caught. He could pull over now if he wanted to. He could have just stopped right there. But he didn't. Well, of course, the very first race was three hours. Dan Gurney was leading, and it put a rod, a rod through the side of the block going through NASCAR three and four. Mm -hmm. And he uh, rolled up to the line and was thinking pretty quickly and looking at his watch. He had his watch on and thought, ooh. And he stopped just short of the line, cranked the wheel over, and then when the three hours ticked by, he just let it roll over the line. Tell us that story yesterday. He used that thinking, thinking, yeah. And they immediately passed a rule saying, don't do that. Don't do that. Do that. <laughs> Can't do that. This so often happens in racing. Somebody comes up with a better idea. And you can see the drivers, even a guy who has seen as much of this sport in all its various forms as Juan Pablo Montoya is dancing on that pit stand. This is a very special moment for any driver, for any mechanic, for any team owner. And to do it multiple times as these guys have. The guys in what appears will be the GT class winning Mazda are all winning it for the first time. But you can be sure that Sylvan Tremblay, David Haskell, Nick Ham, and Rafi Matos are no more delighted than Scott Pruitt, Memo Rojas, Juan Pablo Montoya, and Dario Franchitti. Scott Pruitt spent more than a decade in go-karts and became one of America's best, winning the title many times. And he has gone on to a terrific career. And today, for Ganassi Racing, Scott Pruitt crosses the line for Ganassi's third straight victory in the Rolex 24 at Daytona, and now they can all exhale. You can breathe again, Chip. <laughs> and he, well, he is. What a career Scott Pruitt is still in the middle of. Absolutely extraordinary. The winningest driver in the series. He now has his third overall victory in this race. I remember Jack Roush once telling me he thought maybe Scott Pruitt spent too much time in go-karts. Should have got into <laughs> auto racing a little early on. Put this in perspective. Scott Pruitt is who I replaced in 1988 at Roush to win my championship. And that's how many years ago? <laughs> how many years ago? Uh, that would be 20. Yeah. 20 years back. It's a little warm in that race car. Scott's got the door open. There is the runner-up car. After a valiant effort, Bob Stallings, Gaines Co. Racing Group. Great effort here. Really home good. in second place. And that is a big step up from where they were at this time last year. Of course, as we've mentioned, the season is just beginning. The first of 14 races on the Daytona prototype schedule. 13 make up the season for the GT cars. And uh, bumping, bumping at the line. Time to right a few wrongs during the previous 24 hours or just get your picture taken. Yep. Remember when we did the Roush 1, 2, 3, Robbie Gordon crashed all three of us into the wall of purpose. <laughs> A whole slew of new records as you see Alex Gurney, the father looking on. I'm sure Mom Evie back home in California is watching as well. Here comes your GT winner. 
Sylvan Tremblay. On behalf of the team that he runs, flashing his headlights as he wins the GT division. Now these guys will really be happy. They've never won before. They've never won this race before. A whole history book full of new records for lead changes, different leaders, caution flags, and more. We'll be back to start wrapping up our live speed coverage of the 46th Rolex. We've got about 25 minutes to go, so don't go anywhere. We'll be back. Welcome back to Victory Lane here at Daytona. Scotty Pruitt bringing the car to Victory Lane, third time overall, second in a row, Scott. What a day for you, mate. Familiar place. Oh, this is, oh gosh, this is awesome. Thanks to all the Ganassi guys, Chip Ganassi, hi to my kids at home. This is over the top. I mean, to come here and win this thing overall and now to do it back to back, three in a row for Chip. Telmex, Pirelli did a great job of tires, and Lexus. I don't know if any manufacturer's ever done that, but uh, wow, this is unbelievable. You've been in there a long time, mate. Hop on now, it's been a long 24 hours, but Scotty, when you reflect back on the end of last year, that season finale, what might have been, Chip Ganassi comes in, record for this team owner. Scott, it was a tough blow there at the end of last season to lose the championship that way. Had there been a long off season, how's it feel now? This is awesome. I mean, a good way to come back, a good way to start the year, same way we did last year. We're just going to keep doing it. I mean, as long as we can keep coming here and winning like we do, it's just, uh, this is a true test of man and machine. All the guys back at the shop, all the guys in North Carolina, up in Indianapolis, all the Ganassi guys, this is a team effort, and it's unbelievable. Yeah! <laughs> Let's get Mamo Rojas in here. He's going to be Scotty's teammate for the year. Mamo, last year was a tough race for you, mate. I know you're extremely disappointed to come back a year later and win this thing. How about that? Yeah, it's an awesome feeling, man. We had a, such a tough one last year, but, I mean, come back and win with these guys, I mean, it's like a dream come true. Talk about the rest of the season. You're now in the lead of this championship. Long way to go, a lot of competition out there. Well, it's good to start at the top. Uh, I mean, there's there's a lot of races, a very good competition coming, a lot of things happening, but uh, I mean, certainly Ganassi Racing and every all our sponsors have been doing a great job, and I think we're going to have a good chance this year. All right, mate, congratulations. Let's move on back. Another one of the winning, winning guys here, Dario Franchitti. Dario, we spoke before the off yesterday. Your mantelpiece is pretty full, but how about it? You're the third Indy 500 champion to come here the following year and win this big one. That must be an amazing feeling for you right now. It's been a hell of a year. You know, with Sebring, Indy, the championship, and now Daytona 24 with my new team here. <laughs> Bloody amazing. These these guys, the preparation they put into this car is the reason we're here. We uh, we just tried to stay out of trouble, and uh, here we are. Bloody brilliant. In one year, you got the Sebring 12-hour win, the class win, the Indy 500, this one. There's a big race coming up in a couple of weeks, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that one's going to be a little bit more difficult, <laughs> but we'll, uh, we'll give it a go. As All I right. just said to one, it's a pretty good start. All right, and here he is, Juan Montoya. Second year in a row, buddy. But this race was a little bit different. Last year, you were in the thick of the action. A heck of a battle going down to the checkered flag. But this year, a little bit smoother sailing for you. Yeah, it was pretty hard into the last scene. You know, it was. Uh, we were pretty close with the six car. They had a problem, and after that, you know, it was more bringing the car home sorry all right mate well they want to get their photos in congratulations to the whole team what a performance by chip ganassi racing and all four drivers no question about it calvin and that's a great shot right there they not only won they basically dominated they led 252 of the 695 total laps more than a third of the distance including the last 100 laps Congratulations to them. Now let's go to Chris Neville with the GT winning crew. Well, so much of that spotlight is always on the prototypes, but now we've got the GT winners too. We've got the 70 car, Rafael Matos. Rafael, this was your first running at this race. You get the win. You get the win for Mazda. It's been a while since they've been in victory lane. Yeah, definitely. Unbelievable feeling right now. It's, I can't describe right now. It's, you know, something I, I've never felt in my life. And, you know, I'm very honored to be part of the family, the Mazda family again, very honored to to be part of the program and you know we we all deserve this victory you know the whole speed source mazda uh crew work really hard this for for this race and you know we all deserve this and i'm i can't thank enough the castro for the all support all the support they, they've been giving us and you know thank you very much everyone well this is rafa's first run but nick your 10th run and you've been also running full season with this team you just got to be feel great to just finally break through get the win yeah what a great way to start the year special thanks to castro and master 
and uh, everybody involved on the team. And I want to uh, say a special thanks to my wife back home for helping me prepare for the race and, and get, uh, get in shape. And just uh, I wish she was here to share it with me. And Sylvan Tremblay, this is your team. You built four of these cars for this field. All four of them finished, and you got three in the top ten. Not bad, huh? Uh, <laughs> uh, just really just a testament to Mazda. I mean, they stuck with this rotary engine that we all love, and uh, what a motor. I mean, unbelievable. The combination of the rotary along with the Castrol, just reliability like you can't believe. We were flat out the entire time. So that's what it takes, and just uh, a dream come true. I mean, you know, to do it, my best friend and co-driver and engine builder, Dave, uh, you know, we've gone through a lot, and uh, just a lot of respect for all the competitors. I see Kevin back there. Just so much respect for, for Mr. Buckler and his organization and the standards that he set here. And, you know, Porsche's done a great job, but uh, Mazda's back. And David, so often the, in the, during the season, Brian and I are pulling on your leg to get the answers because you run the team, but in the long races, you help do the driving too. Pretty emotional win for you. Yeah, very. Um, it's just uh, we work so hard. Everybody at the shop, everybody just pours everything they can into this. And, you know, to be part of building the car and building the motors and driving and, you know, Sylvain works on them and welds and puts them together and then getting to drive them, it's just overwhelming. It is. And to do this, it's like just overwhelming. It's unbelievable. Mazda gets their 22nd class win at Daytona. That's right. A new era for Mazda in GT. The Ganassi era is already in full flight. In winning the race overall three straight times, Ganassi have led 53% of the laps run in the last three Rolex 24s here at Daytona. Congratulations to all of the winners. Another, another memorable edition of this race is now in the books. We've still got more to come. Stick around. We'll be back live to Daytona International Speedway in just a moment. We've heard from our overall and Daytona prototype winners. Now let's take a look at the rest of the top 10 in the Daytona prototypes. Great effort from Penske Taylor Racing. Top three there with Castro, Nevis, Briscoe and Bush. Both Crone Racing cars in the top 10. Both Mike Shank Racing cars in the top 10. And the spirit of Daytona, the eight cylinder Porsche getting there in 10th position. To Brian Till. The Gainsco crew ends up second, which is a lot better off than they were last year. I was just asking Bob Stallings. He's wearing a Rolex Daytona. I said, when you win it next year, can I have that one? But Alex, for you, you finished the race, and I know this has to feel so good after the disappointment here last year. I know you guys won the short race, but you want the 24. Yeah, you're right. It really does feel good. I mean, I guess we feel a little bit off because you know to come this long 24 hours and to see the wind just right there is is tough but anyway everyone did an excellent job all my teammates were awesome uh you know really never made any mistakes and uh just really proud of everybody on the gamesco team Lowe's, super happy I think that's the thing that's impressive, John. Nobody on this team put a wheel wrong the entire 24 hours under some incredibly difficult conditions. Yeah, that was one of our objectives, and uh, we all talked about that for, for a while before the start of this race. Uh, we wanted to keep the tires underneath us, and we did a really go good job doing that. We didn't have any issues there. And um, with the changing conditions, it was pretty hard. But uh, like Alex said, everybody did a fantastic job. Uh, Jimmy and Jimmy, it's awesome to run with these guys. Uh, not only are they super quick, but they're super uh, fun guys to hang around with. So uh, it's good. You know, and you talk about nobody putting a wheel wrong, Jimmy. I mean, for you, these are really difficult conditions. You guys don't run in the rain, but you went out there. You ran in those difficult conditions. You had a good time. I think the Rolex 24 is in your blood. It is. I truly love this event. And I think Vassar and I both are just happy we didn't screw up the championship <laughs> deal. Uh, we wish we could have won. We felt like we were uh, in contention throughout the event. But uh, just, in, you know, truly enjoy this event and, and thank, uh, so thankful that these guys let me come and race with them. So I'm, I'm stoked. Every one of Jimmy Johnson's contracts from now on going to leave that last weekend in January open? Fortunately, Mr. Hendrick's a racer, and he loves uh, <laughs> loves watching races. And I'm sure you'll want to come down at some point and be involved, so maybe we can talk him into coming down next year. Yeah, I think we'll see Jimmy Johnson back here again, Cal. Uh, I certainly think we will, and certainly Penske Racing have made an immediate impression on returning to Daytona, as you would expect. Tim Sindrick just having a quick debrief with the boys here. Plenty of smiles here. Awesome. Elio, I know you made a lot of waves over the off-season with your dancing skills, but I'm sure it's good to be behind the wheel again and getting on with the serious business for the it season. Is, it is awesome to be racing again. I mean, 24 hours Daytona is a perfect race, you know, after the vacations, the holiday, and uh, everybody's, you know, uh, having hard work over the, the off-season. It's a perfect race because it's long. I mean, everybody can 
share the car, you know, so um, I'm extremely happy with the third place. All the problems that we had, uh, you know, in finishing the top three, that's, uh, that's just to prove this team never gave up. Congratulations, and Kurt, you got a busy week ahead of you, mate. I mean, it's uh, one of the most hectic test weeks for the NASCAR boys, and you start off with a 24-hour race. How are you feeling right now? I'm feeling okay, a little woozy. I've got to head to the West Coast for our test. Um, that's what pays the bills, but uh, I had a great time with these boys. You know, we, we ran our pace. Uh, we had a couple bit of uh, overheating issues, but, you know, we also had a guy go down in the pits. Randy uh, had a seizure, and so our hearts, are, our prayers are out with him right now. But everything's okay at the hospital, but we're thanking Toshiba and SunTrust for this effort i had a blast and ryan briscoe podium finish here has to feel good big season ahead of you in the irl but uh having the boss up there in the pit stand is a pretty special feeling for a young driver right calling the shots oh it's amazing just uh, as helio said to to kick the season off with a race like this um it really brings the whole team together uh it's all about team effort here and uh rp i don't think he ever got down from that stand so uh, it's just absolutely amazing and got to thank everyone kurt and elio for for their jobs Cindric for his strategy he is a magician and uh just the whole team it's been a lot of fun all right mate great run thanks let's take a look at the gt top 10 and it's the mighty mazda rx8 bookending the top five both speed source cars there and the three trg porsches in the middle and the remaining five in the top ten as we hear from our runners up in the gt class well it's a familiar face back here in second place andy lally you've had one win at this race but this is your third second place starting to feel like a bridesmaid yeah you know uh Seconds, it's a great run, but um, it does sting a little bit. But yeah, there's there's really there's really uh, a whole lot of positives for this. Uh, Bryce Miller and Ted Ballou are starting the season uh, in real good points position here, and uh, those two are going to challenge for the championship, I'm sure. Bryce did a great job along with uh, Westy here, and uh, and Ted. Everybody did a super job. There's not a scratch on this car. Nobody touched a single car wall pothole anything on this thing it's just a bunch of chip paint from from rubber marks and these guys absolutely did a great job and i'm positive they're going to be contending for a championship this year well i hope we see andy lally at more races he's got to focus on craftsman truck though but bryce you are focusing on this championship last year you finished third in it but you switched over to trg now yeah that's right i'm really looking forward to it this year i mean ted blue is a great co-driver to have and uh last year i missed out on capturing these points so uh so It'll be nice to be in the hunt for, for this time around. Well, impressive run by Kevin Buckler. Seven cars here, 100 crew members. Good podium finish. Impressive Brian. run from two teams as well as we go to Brian for more. It's deep, deep talent on the TRG crew. Roma Dumas, Brian Sellers, Tim George, Spencer Pompelli. You guys come home third. I know Manny well, Collard is around here somewhere. Tim, though, Spencer, you guys in this car together all season long. And, we said it all 24 hours that we've covered this race, and that was winning this race is special, but coming out of here with good points for the season, I think that's what's important. Oh, definitely. This is my first 24. I'm so excited to be with TRG and the great opportunity Kevin Buckler gave me, and real excited to be here at Daytona on this awesome speedway and this great day. Well, Spencer, great job by you. I know you guys fought problems all, all day long. Listen to it on the scanner. The car was very, very warm. We saw 260 degrees on the water temp in the last couple hours, which, you know, it should have blown up at 240. So who knows how we finished, but it was a great job by everyone at TRG. Incredible team, an incredible group of people that Kevin's put together. I've got to thank Tim, all my co-drivers. Monster Cable is with us. i just uh, really proud to be part of such a strong effort. Congratulations, guys. The SunTrust Improve Your Position Award is back for 2008 and we congratulate in the Daytona prototype class the 75 Crone Racing Machine making up 18 positions but even more impressively in GT the JLo Racing 64 26 positions to win the SunTrust Improve Your Position Award. Speed's coverage of the Rolex 24 at Daytona is brought to you by Pirelli. Power is nothing without control. And powered by the first ever Pontiac G8, the official car of the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series. Well, the 2008 season is now officially underway. And for the folks of the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series, the next event will be March 29th at Homestead Miami Speedway. Of course, it'll be on speed. And Lee Diffie, Dorsey Schrader and company will be there. It was another epic running of the Rolex 24 with all the great stories playing out. None bigger than Ganassi Racing coming home with their third straight victory. Let's give you a few final thoughts from the booth, starting with the man on the mic for the season, Lee Diffie. 
Bob, I think uh, when you look at the Ganassi three-peat, it's an amazing accomplishment. But those guys are big stars. They're used to winning. You saw how much it meant to the little guys, the unknowns in the world of motorsport like Speed Source. Dave Haskell, Sylvan Tremblay, they broke down. They were overcome with emotion. That's how much they put into this. Dorsey Schrader. Well, I'll tell you, this was a tough one as far as driving goes because of that weather we saw last night. It never really poured down rain. Had it poured down rain, it would have been easier. That on and off again, that is the hardest conditions a driver can encounter. Well, all these 24-hour races are really are a lottery, and this one was made more so by that dodgy weather, which started before the race started on lap one, the pace lap. We had 14 cars in the pits changing their tyres before we had the green flag. But, of course, a lot of teams, like Mike Shank, did a tremendous job. They had two cars on the front row, and they finished in the top ten with both those cars in spite of little troubles during the race. A lot of people had some troubles, a lot of which was caused by the rain and, of course, dust and sand getting dragged onto the track and then getting jammed in the radiator. So... One way or another, it was a pretty exciting race, but the, that driver lineup in the number in the O1 car was just too tough. I mean, there just wasn't a weak link in that chain, and obviously with the Ganassi organization behind him, unbeatable. Well, I'll second what you guys have said. There's only two cars that can win their divisions at the Rolex 24, but there are so many memories that these teams and drivers will take away from this race. Once again, it's just the beginning of a long season, another hard-fought championship campaign that may go down to the last race, just as it did in 2007. But that all lies in the future. Right now, we have this endurance classic in its 46th year to remember. On behalf of all of us here at Speed, but especially our announced team, Lee Diffie, Dorsey Schrader, David Hobbs, Calvin Fish, Brian Till, Chris Neville, and Andrew Marriott, I'm Bob Varshia, wishing you farewell. That is my name, isn't it? <laughs> Close to that. Farewell from Daytona International Speedway. We'll see you again soon.